Well, we have a little bit of time. Uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, is going to be with us for a few more minutes. If others have questions that uh, they want to pose, we we'll start with Howard, and we'll ask people to identify themselves. Howard Shapiro, uh, attorney in Albany. Um, two quick comments and then a question. Uh, first, uh, sitting here as a retired uh, uh, citizen of New York, uh, hearing uh, the governor speak, uh, it just increases my frustration that as voters we do not have an opportunity to vote for people like uh, Dick Ravage for governor. <laughs> uh, second thing is, uh, I think a lot of people believe on your point that people who go into public service are not in it for the money, that there is too large a segment of public officials who do go in it for the money because they couldn't get better jobs in the private sector. My question is uh, one that relates to what you identified, I think, as the heart of uh, solving budget problems in the state. And that is there always seems to be some cash around to band-aid the problem and avoid facing the long-term uh, structural issues. That would seem to say that uh, in a perverse way, the stock market, which New York uniquely relies upon, both in bonuses and other kinds of taxes, going up alleviates the pressure on politicians to face the major uh, budget and uh, <coughs> fiscal problems of the state. Is there anything in that? Well, obviously, the financial services uh, community in New York City provides a very substantial percentage of both the personal income tax, corporate income tax, and various other miscellaneous ta tax revenues that are critical to New York. That's why uh, 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 one of the reasons why I think just taxing financial services is a mistake because they are so mobile. Uh, given the technology that exists today, Many things I disagree with Mayor Bloomberg about, but he's absolutely right when he says if you put a tax on that industry, they have move across the river in 36 hours. He's absolutely right. And they're going to put a bigger tax on and make it severely prejudicial. You know, again, they, in a funny sense, and I, I, I won't belabor the point, but we, we've always had this fundamental lack of clarity what we, sh how we should tax at a national level and how we should tax at a state and local level. Uh, uh, and, and um, you know, when I read the deficit reduction or the recommendations, for example, that we eliminate the mortgage interest deduction, my first reaction was, since we have a unitary taxing system here, that'd be great for New York State and probably add uh, a billion dollars to our revenue. for mortgage interest would be eliminated. But then I thought for a minute and I said, um, you know, if my taxes went up, the value of my house would go down. And I'd be into the local assessor claiming I wanted a reduction in my AV. And I'm sure that I haven't measured it, I don't have the skills to do that. But there would be an enormous reduction in the amount of uh, property taxes collected by counties and cities, uh, if that were to go first. So I don't know what the name is. Um, to me, it just proves the fact that in a society like ours in the United States, and given the, this enormous technological revolution we have, we've got to rethink how we tax. My own th belief is that uh, it's easier to tax at a national level than it is at a local level, otherwise you you produce an enormous amount of artificial and arguably temporary physical dislocations. I think uh, Assemblyman Benjamin had a question. Hey, Richard. Um, one question. How do, how do you suggest we change local dynamics so ideas like yours can actually have a chance of going forward? You know, what I found to be difficult with your, with your issues, not for me, with my colleagues, there's no ribbon to cut or picture we taken of. Um, so how do you get the hard choice to really take it and then be able to deal with the political dynamics and getting our friends or the fourth that say, you know, to write the story that really talks about how do we save New York and New Yorkers and not attack elected officials who, when they're pushed to a corner, you know, don't want to respond. 
Michael, I again will say publicly how sorry I am that you chose to give up uh, elected politics because you were an example of the kind of person in the legislature who was willing to address these, these serious issues. Uh, uh, I think, I mean, I, I give you all a somewhat facetious answer to that. One, one solution is bring back the bosses. We had better candidates than we had candidates before. <laughs> and young people had a way of moving up the political ladder without being independently wealthy or having to rely on, uh, uh, as I said earlier, people who had a great interest in the outcome. I'm, I'm not facetious about that. I, I'm not sure we have better people in elective office now that we have no political parties that mean very much except to occasional appointment of judges or something like that. Uh, uh, but it is part of a change in our culture. It's part of, of the selfishness of this society, which I really do describe it. How, how do we get people to care about the whole uh, and less concerned about themselves? And if that culture were to change, and maybe the severity of our problems will force that to change, maybe more people will do what you have done and, and what a lot of other people have done and have chose to, to go into public life for all the right reasons, thinking they make a better world for, for their families and their kids and their friends. Diana, and then we have a question up here. Good morning. I'm Diana Hinchler from the New York State Education Department. Uh, first, may I thank you for your service to New York. I think we are all the richer for what you've given us. Uh, my question is this. This morning you've laid out a number of challenges that New York has. If you were designing a program for, say, in the short term, the next year and maybe even a little beyond, to resolve the budget deficit and to get New York's economy, state and regional, back on track, what would be the key components of that program? that in a way that's consistent with what I said earlier. There is no absolute right or wrong way. I think that first of all, I would make sure that I understood what the impact would be by additional cuts in healthcare, education, etc. being those being the biggest expenditures. I'd want to understand that. I want to understand what was tolerable and what wasn't. Then I would convene the labor leadership, the business leadership, not necessarily the organizations that are the stated leaders, but the, the, the key principles, uh, and the major publishers of our newspaper. I would ask them to devote a period of time in which they would negotiate with each other under, with all the expertise of, of the state government uh, available to answer any questions, to, to say this is what we have to cut and this is what we have tax, and this is what the benefits that are going to have to be reduced. And that is not a right or wrong answer to that. I would try to conduct a negotiation amongst the parties whose consent would be necessary to accomplish that result. Because that's the only way democracy can make these kinds. No, I might fail, uh, but I, I can't predict since I'm not going to have the opportunity to do it. We'll go to AJ McMahon. Oh. Uh, AJ McMahon from the Empire Center. Governor, thank you very much for 
through service. You made a you made a, a remark earlier on about how you thought the federal government would have to have some role in imposing discipline on the states. And as you you're probably aware, there's two specific proposals have surfaced from the new House majority in the last week that specifically would affect states. One is a proposal that would actually uh, remove the tax exempt status of bonds issued by states and municipalities and that did not meet certain enhanced guidelines for transparency of their pension funds, financial conditions. Hmm. The second is a proposal to create a bankruptcy path for state governments, as you may have heard, which seems to have support from some of the leading incoming Republican chairs in the subject area. I'm wondering what you think of those proposals, if you've had a chance to, to look at them or read about them, and, and in the bankruptcy proposal in particular, what you might see as the pluses and minuses of that. Well, <clears throat> let me answer both as best I can, Jay. Uh, number one, uh, to remove the tax exempt status of the state's borrowing uh, is, uh, I assume you mean on future borrowing, not on existing ones, because you've got an <coughs> existing contract, and I would assume the impairment clauses in our constitutions would prevent that from happening. Uh, and and um, I think that there are other ways of disciplining states that are less punitive uh, than that, uh, because that automatically means if the interest rate differential is 150 basis points, for example, you're talking about a significant hit on a state budget, uh, and you have to be very precise on what the quid pro quo is. Um, and uh, uh, I can't help but comment that uh, with 35 Republican governors just learning now uh, the problems they face, uh, I, I'm curious whether Mr. Boehner's going to get behind that proposal six months from now. <laughs> As far as bankruptcy is concerned, I don't believe as a constitutional matter uh, that it can be done without the consent of the state. Uh, and therefore, if I'm right, then ultimately it comes down to, to the fundamental proposition that every state ultimately has to take some responsibility to change the political, economic paradigm. What the federal government can do without a state's consent is to set some conditions uh, that are not unreasonable, such as they could say no school aid, uh, no more uh, uh, transportation aid unless you're willing, unless you enact uh, requirements for balanced budgets. They can do something like that. Um, and if I'm right at the total disconnect that exists between the Congress and the state governments, it's not that terrible a political lift uh, for members of Congress to do that. Um, you know, I'll just tell you all an anecdote without mentioning names. There are a group of congressmen from New York that I talked to at the time that the Congress was considering extending provisions in the stimulus bill gave the federal government a bigger pickup of uh, Medicaid expense and education expense. And I asked, uh, these are all people I've known for a long time, uh, are they going to vote for it? And they said, yeah, we're going to vote for it uh, because Nancy Pelosi's cracking the whip. Uh, we're not voting for it because we want to vote for it. And I said, well, I'm curious, why is that? <coughs> And they said every time we vote for more deficit spending in Washington, we give our opponent in this fall's election a big issue. So why should we vote for more deficit spending in Washington to bail out a bunch of politicians in Albany who don't have the guts to cut our tax there? And I thought that was a very, I mean, that's a marvelous description of what's happened to American federalism. 
I'm sorry, I think we're at the end of our time. I, I uh, do want to mention that the uh, reports that have been issued by the Lieutenant Governor himself, by the Rockefeller Institute, on his behalf are available. Some copies are outside this room, others are out, they're all up on our website. We are expecting one additional report uh, fairly shortly. And uh, Lieutenant Governor Roberts, we know that these issues are going to be discussed uh, in New York and nationwide in the coming year and for a long time, and, and that a lot of people will be looking for your advice. And we are very grateful to the you today.